According to watchmakers, users and people of different types and beliefs, Omega Speedmaster, widely known as Moon's Watch, is often if not always considered the best ever to exist. With a claim like that and a set of features to back up the bragging rights, the only competition Omega has is the most famous watch in the world today, the Rolex Daytona. However, with fame not being everything, in our video today we'll describe how and why we think the Omega Speedmaster is a far better pick than the Rolex Daytona. So without further ado, let's begin. Let's start with why the Speedmaster exists in the first place. Originating in 1957, four full years before mankind stepped on the moon and the same year where the space age had begun, it's normal to assume given the specs that Omega made the watch for NASA exclusively. But you'd be wrong. So if not for NASA, why make it at all? Well, a little hint, the clues in the title. Yes, the word professional means a lot here since in 1957, Omega released three pro watches that were built solid, big in size and meant to be used by the industry. Omega watches in general were built as a statement to Omega's panache for precision engineering with a combination of artistry and craftsmanship. And in a market that was saturated with bulky sports watches, this felt like a breath of fresh air. They maintained a solid lead up until Rolex came up with heavyweights like Submariner, GMT Master and Milgauss. Omega did not realize that people would need watches as an extension of their workplace and this is where Rolex caught them off guard except for the chronograph where things began to go downhill. While other watches were based around the same architecture, the chronograph was too far removed to be able to fit the mold, making the selection process severely outdated. This gave Omega a massive opening to strike forth and reclaim their territory. The Speedmaster was responsible for setting up a new trend utilizing the full potential of the chronograph. Previously, chronographs were comparatively smaller and did not prioritize other elements such as a tachymeter scale. For a chronograph that's specifically designed for sports, it needed to be clear, chunky and of course relatively easy to use. The tachymeter moved outside the crystal, the dial did gain some amount of clarity and contrast which resulted in an inflation of about 38mm. However, Omega had an ace up its sleeve. Yes, granted Rolex could deal with water damage in an efficient manner and their watches were a good pick for pilots as it had saved them from dealing with mathematical solutions, but Omega had the Olympics. Omega had been sponsoring Olympic Games since 1932, giving the Speedmaster an impressive level of bragging rights. Now, Rolex did not have anything else to compete against that apart from the association with a few pros in the industry. In terms of aesthetics, Rolex watches were not as good looking as Omega watches, neither were they more refined or well built, and in our eyes it felt downright ugly from an industrial perspective. With the Olympics being the peak sporting event, Omega had every opportunity to become the perfect watch in that regard, so naturally, the way Omega was inspired by the Submariner, Rolex borrowed the impression from the Speedmaster. It took about 5 years but Rolex was able to finally update their chronograph to be able to keep up with the Speedmaster by pushing the tachymeter outside the crystal and implementing a contrasting dial. They also buffed the size of the case and in response Omega expanded the Speedmaster to 42mm. This war between watchmakers had been running for about a century where there were wins and losses for both parties. But in the chapter of the Speedmaster, Omega was the clear winner. However, for Rolex, things were a bit grim. This doesn't really mean that they failed a test from NASA, but there's the thing. You're not gonna fail if you don't give the test in the first place. And that's exactly what happened back in 1964, one year before the release of Daytona. US distributors sent a pre-Daytona 6238 to NASA that used the same Valley Juice 72 chronograph which stopped working two times during testing. It also produced a lot of condensation during the humidity test and the hands stopped working against each other in the temperature test. Then again, this wouldn't be the first time Rolex failed professional scrutiny since the Submariner was unable to meet the requirements of the US Navy back in 1958. Regardless of how you look at it, it's pretty obvious that the Speedmaster had lit a fire under Daytona and it burned the brightest in terms of movement. Back then, the difference between the watch movement of both watches wasn't minor at all. 
Both these watches were hand wound and had column wheel movement, but only the Speedmaster Caliber 321 passed the test from NASA. Enough about the past, but what about now? The Moon watch is available right now with the same Caliber 321 if you can afford it, but the Omega 3861 is a far more affordable alternative. The latest Daytona from Rolex comes with an engine in the form of Caliber 4130 which is an effectively competent movement but has zero points in cool when compared with Omega. The 4130 kept itself bound while lasting for about 72 hours and came with a thick vertical clutch with efficient and minimal parts, all good so far. Sure, Omega struggled to touch 50 hours and needed to be cranked up constantly and the horizontal clutches were prone to stuttering, but honestly, we saw a very small number of people caring about that. Just take a look at the Caliber 3861 and you'll see exactly what we mean when we say that this is what we want rather than what we need. Rolex does not bother putting them on display because of a misconception that they assume no one wants to check out the inner workings of a watch and after checking out the intricate display on Omega, to us the visuals is worth the price alone. Oh, and another thing, the sapphire backed version of the 3861 Power Speedmaster will cost you half the price of a Rolex Daytona. Yep, let that sink in. A funny story, the first watch worn on the moon was not worn by the first man on the moon, but rather the second one. The reason behind this makes the Speedmaster even more endearing and impactful. During the mission, the lunar module failed and Armstrong left his Speedmaster behind to take over. As you can tell, this is no marketing stunt but simply the watch doing what it was built for with elegance, grace and a sense of reliability. Upon landing the Apollo 11, Buzz Aldrin's watch was taken away to become one of the most iconic exhibits to be displayed but unfortunately, it never made the trip. This happened back in 1969, years before Rolex Daytona watches were being robbed of people. Now, before stealing watches was a thing and before the Daytonas were trending, people were stealing moon watches. The reason? Aldrin's moon watch, the original one, was still up for grabs and people were desperate to find it. While NASA did act quickly and had possession of the Speedmaster from Armstrong and Collins, the watch that belonged to Aldrin is still out there, somewhere. These are but a few reasons why financially, spiritually, mechanically and of course historically, Omega Speedmaster is better than Rolex Daytona. We do hope that you like this trip back in time but enough about that, what's your opinion regarding both watches? Do let us know as we would love to hear from you. And as for everything else, don't forget to like, share, subscribe and hit the bell icon if you want more content like this on your feed.